This is the Smallmouth Crush Podcast Season 2. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This podcast that will interview some of the top local and regional anglers in North America. Anglers who consistently finish near the top in both largemouth and smallmouth bass fishing tournaments. Travis and his guest will discuss techniques and strategies used to help these anglers stay so consistent and help you become a better angler and gain an edge on your body of water and now here's your host of the smallmouth crush podcast travis manson hello welcome to the smallmouth crush podcast my name is travis manson another great week every other week on this podcast talking with some of the great local and regional tournament anglers across the country and i'm really excited about tonight's guest i actually fished against him back in the day back in wisconsin he, he was uh he was one of those guys that was always up there in the leaderboard and uh, all the guys that we were always trying to uh, to beat. We fished a lot of the same water. I don't want to spill the whole story. We're going to we're going to bring them on. But before we go there, I want to talk about, of course, the Real Shot. Real Shot's been a sponsor of this podcast. I encourage you guys, if you need any of your fishing tackle needs, head on over to therealshot.com. Here's why. Number one, they got a lot of great baits. They got a great selection of baits, same day shipping. And we're going to give you a discount. That discount code, smallmouthcrush15. Say 15% off your first order. It's a big deal. If you can save money. They got all the top brands you guys know. Mega Bass, Z-Man, Shimano, Daiwa, St. Croix Rods, Kitech. Pretty much anything and everything you could want. Head on over to the Real Shot. Use my code smallmouthcrush15 and get 15% off. Your first order. Let's bring them on. Jim, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, Travis. Thanks. Excited to talk to you because we fished together or, well, actually, we did fish together. Come to we did fish. Yeah. I forgot uh, all about that. The all species tournament. <laughs> which we dominated, dude. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Due to us getting on a school of white bass, I believe. That's true. So the all species <laughs> event back home in Wisconsin, and it was just what it says. It was a multi-species. So I think it was white bass, panfish, northern bass, of course, and probably something else. Walleye, if you want. I don't know if we brought in the walleye. No, I don't think we did. I think we brought in a pike and some bass and then a limit of white bass. It was pretty cool. It was actually the first time fishing that section of the river for me pretty intensely like we did. We went we went north. We went up the area that you're really familiar with that you, you've done a lot of damage on back in the day and having you kind of show for me around up there and, and lay, give me in the lay of the land and how things laid out when we were fishing and catching these largemouth here and there. And I think you caught a pretty big small, I think we won big fish species too for a couple of those categories. So pretty cool. Right. We got, a, we got our name on the trophy. That's uh, yeah, forever there. <laughs> so whoever, whoever that's wins right. uh, this season's uh multi-species they'll 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 see our names on that trophy in all seriousness you've uh you've done really well fishing tournaments and growing up in northeast wisconsin and, and fishing against you and then when i actually left to make the move across the country uh, right around that time i think you uh decided to take a little trip not too far away but closer to the minnesota border fascinating to learn kind of how you broke some of those fisheries down and, and, you know, to this day, you still do very well in events over there. But before we get into all that, Jim, if you could just briefly take a moment just to introduce yourself to the viewers and listeners that may not be familiar with and, and let us know what you're all up to and kind of your journey to where you're, where you're at now. I started tournament fishing roughly 1999. Um, got in with the uh, Oshkosh Bassmasters crew and um, from there I really enjoyed it and I kind of gave up all my other hobbies to focus on bass fishing I said if I could concentrate on one sport I might be able to get good at it and the sport I chose to chase was tournament bass fishing so got in with a few good guys I got in with uh, Mike Mann uh, we became good friends and tournament partners pretty much for my whole call it career if even though that's not my real job, but at least in tournament fishing. We fished together 13 years, I believe, before I moved, like you said, to basically the western part of Wisconsin here, just across the border from Minnesota. I can almost see it from my porch. So it was a interesting move coming over here. The fishing over here is 
I'm going to say extremely good. If you've, well, I'm sure anybody who's familiar with the lakes around the greater Minneapolis area understand that the fishing's extremely good despite being in a very populated area. And it, mm -hmm. it never even, well, it keeps surprising me year after year. It's like, there's no way this lake, you know, we have a couple of Chisago lakes that kick out 20 pound bags in evening tournaments all the time. And you're like, ah, oh, this lake can't do it again. And it does it mm. every time. So despite literally 24 seven pressure on the lakes. So I don't know. That's, it was a, sh go ahead. No, I, I'm just saying that's really interesting to, uh, that you say that, like, do you, do you feel it's, it's more pressure than places you fished growing up in, in Northeast Wisconsin even? Yeah. So, you know, Lake Winnebago gets pressure, but it's huge. You can go so many different places and you can go to a spot that probably nobody's cast the lure in you know, three months if you're ambitious. So um, here, I mean, we're on literally 1,000 or 1,500 acre lakes and everybody has every rock named on it. The spots are known by everyone. So mm -hmm. it really, and it's, I hate to say it too, there's 25 boats fishing an evening tournament and whoever can spot lock on uh, that one rock um, has a chance to win it, you know? So mm -hmm. it's a, it's kind of a different mentality. It's a mentality of fishing. I don't, I'm going to say, I, I don't like camping, but that's how a lot of these tournaments here get won is, you know, you pick your stretch and you pretty much live and die on it. So, so it's, different that way but it's still tournament fishing and it always poses a challenge so that's the fun thing is you know trying to um, solve the puzzle basically mm -hmm. for that night or that day to, under those conditions and obviously coming in with the five biggest fish that you can to try to cash a check so when i started fishing back in wisconsin and getting into the tournament scene you were well deep into it uh, by uh, by a number of years and competing on specifically the Winnebago chain, the upper bodies of water, the Wolf River, Lake Poygan, Winnie Connie, Butamore. For those that aren't familiar with, it's a huge, huge system, largemouth and smallmouth. Back then, I, 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 I think the largemouth dominated for a little while and the smallmouth bite got heavy. I really want to focus a little bit about those early days, you know, before all these crazy uh, electronics and things like that came out. Although you were one of the first running a uh, side image unit, I do recall that. I, I think you had your your hummingbird dialed in, like within the first year it came out. And how did that help you, or did did you allow, utilize those tools early on to expand, or what was kind of the transition fishing these local tournaments? Because regardless if it was pre side image or not, you put up some good bags of fish. But I think some of the ways you approached it may have been different. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that is true. So when Mike and I started fishing together, you know, 2000, 2002, we had a bunch of, or he had a bunch of spots up the river. And, you know, they were a log here, little rock pile there, that type of thing where we could go and catch a couple of fish. And, you know, basically we would just, you know, use my boat, go run his spots and usually do pretty well. I think it was 2004 five when the first uh i got my first hummingbird 987 so that was revolutionary and i can remember literally going through fremont and i was side imaging the whole river the whole width i could see all the seawalls coming down and i was like oh my gosh this is gonna change everything and it pretty much I shouldn't say overnight, but very close to overnight. Within the next two years, I became an offshore fisherman because I could now see all this structure that you were just guessing on before or something you had to idle directly over to see it on 2D sonar. And now you could just see it literally laid out, you know, on the screen right behind the boat you know, like you're parasailing behind the boat and have x-ray vision and can see everything down underneath the water. So that really changed how I fished. And honestly, it was a key player 
I think in 2007, Mike and I were fortunate enough to win uh, two boats on back-to-back -back weekends. So one of the places was Lake Wissota, further on the western part of the state here. And it was kind of a not a great fishery and it was fishing pretty tough and everybody was going up the river and fishing below the dam because that's you know where all the fish were and all that so i'm like man everybody's up there let's just idle like down below it and we're maybe two or three miles down river of the dam and we found a couple rock piles out in the middle of the river and we're like well uh, we fished a couple times pre-fishing, like, yeah, there's a few fish around here. And that's what basically got it for us in the tournament is just mm -hmm. finding that isolated structure away from everybody else and, you know, getting those couple key bites. So yeah. that was good. And then, you know, the weekend after that, we were fishing up on Lake Tomahawk, fishing deeper than I've ever fished before in like 35 feet of water for deep smallies and dragging jigs and tubes around out there. And again, pre-fishing side imaging, that's where it was. We had a bunch of schools of fish marked and just kept working it and, you know, managed again, another good finish and, mm. you know, winning those boats on back-to-back -back weekends was uh, <laughs> one of the highlights of our career. Sure. So, Heck yeah. No, that's awesome. I know, I, like I said, you've done a lot of damage. You're always a threat. We're always wondering what you had in the bag. I mean, there's only a handful of guys that would would be up there all the time. And your name, you know, we had Paul as well on, on one of the podcasts last season. And of course, back in back in the day, he was the man to be uh, uh, as far as smallmouth. But you started adventuring out with your electronics and, and really opening up a lot of what Lake Winnebago has to offer from an offshore offshore structure standpoint, because there's so many different reefs and so many humps and you, you got real intimate with that area and was able to figure some things out. I mean, I mean, it's a massive body of water, but yeah, I it's would incredible. say <laughs> it was in, I'm an engineer, so I was very systematic. Literally, I did grid searches. I was just picked areas and said, I'm going to grid this whole thing out. So literally every 200 feet, I was making another pass with the boat and literally gridding out acres of water looking for that one rock pile or something different underwater, you know, generally in that 5 to 15 foot range, which is quite a bit of Lake Winnebago. So, you know, I would, you know, literally spend eight hours idling, hoping for marking two spots. So I spent a lot of time doing that and it's not very fun, but <laughs> once you do find it, you knew exactly that you could spin the boat around there and fire a tube on there and catch a fish. So S speaking of tubes, what was the bait of choice back in the day? Did <laughs> you have a variety of different baits or was there a couple real key techniques that you utilize on a regular basis out there? Yeah. So on, well, I laugh, everybody throws Ned rigs down. I let in that Mike and I were throwing the zoom centipedes with like a 16th or an eighth ounce normal worm head on sure. it, nothing major. And then just a straight shank hooked. I used a lot of the Aaron Martin's, uh, robo worm hooks. I think they were branded as, yep. and, they had that little keeper on there, kept the plastic on there, and we could catch dozens of fish off of one centipede. And it, so I, the same, we were throwing Ned rigs before they became popular. So uh. there was a lot of Ned rigs. I shouldn't say Ned rigs, but you know, a that tech technique. Yeah. Yep. Texas rig, just letting it sit there, drifting it down in current. Of course, there's lots of tubes um, that we would fish to, especially in spring fish seem to like the tubes and then i threw a lot of crankbaits back in the day and so that you know if you knew there was a mm, a stump or something like that in the water or rock pile or something then back in the early 2000s those fish could not resist uh uh some of the well they're not tt6s back then but back well, then it was well, the berkeley they? berkeley frenzy 
if you really? remember those, yeah, those things worked really good. And then I was into some of the Lucky Crafts. So I threw a lot of the Lucky Crafts CB100s and CB200s, which were back then exotic Japanese baits. And I would literally have to buy them direct from Japan or off of eBay in order to get them. So those were, I still have boxes of them, but back mm -hmm. then they produced well. So so the area that you live now, did you have any prior real experience fishing those bodies of water prior to moving there? No, I didn't. And at first I thought it was going to be easy. So when I moved here, I said I was not going to get any help from anybody. And that's pretty much what I did, except for a few team tournaments, of course, where I was mm -hmm. fishing with somebody else. But I joined a club where we fished singly and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to learn all these lakes with... Uh, mm, call it a fresh mind and i just went and literally my pre-fishing a lake i've never been on is the first thing i do is i idle the entire perimeter of the lake just on side imaging and i just do that and it gives me a feel for you know depending on time time of year how deep the weeds go what the weeds are how much actual wood might be in the lake, how much rock piles is in there, is there weeds. It just gives you a great feel for the lake before you even wet a line. So mm -hmm. I usually would just spend, I mean, the lake's pretty small. So two or three hours, I would just go in idle. And of course, then I'd waypoint anything interesting. After I spent, you know, three hours idling the lake, I would go back and, you know, start fishing a few things. And then from there, I could generally start keying on, you know, hey, they're on, the first break they're on the edge of the weeds edge of the weeds with rocks that type of stuff i don't know if a pattern per se but I, you know it's hard to say you have a pattern on a you know a 2000 acre lake but you mm -hmm. have spots and that's what i'm mainly after is you know get me a spot that fish can be and i'll go there and fish it so so that's what i kind of did and i remember some of my first tournaments here and you know i'm kind of catching a lot of fish and right. like starting to say, Oh man, I was so, okay. well, my first tournament with my club, I joined and it was pretty funny. I cut, I yanked like a five pounder right away in the morning. And I'm just like smoking three pounder after three pounder in this lake. I, you know, I did my research and it's like, yeah, 12 pound limit is pretty good. You know, 14 mm -hmm. pounds. And like by noon, I had like 18 pounds. And I'm just <laughs> right. like, oh my gosh, everybody's going to think I'm a complete cheater here. Right. And, that. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of the guys were seeing me catch the fish and all that. So I've never been so relieved to come in second place because one of the <laughs> other guys in the club, he managed to, uh, George Sigsworth, he managed to uh, come in with two five pound fish. And I was like, oh, good i didn't win and i think that's the first time i've ever been relieved to not win wow. a tournament <laughs> but yeah so anyways that was the start for um joining my club and you know i came in and you know i shouldn't say smoked them but did pretty good and oh yes. yes since then it's been pretty fun so no that's great i i definitely want to dig in a little bit deeper uh as far as some of the techniques that you're using over there and as well as the difference in, as far as you know, fishing in Wisconsin versus the you know other side of the state and, and, and in Minnesota. Uh, but before we go there, guys, we're going to take a real quick break and we're going to be right back. You're listening to the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. Don't rush out to the water just yet. We'll be right back after this break. Have you ever wondered if your electronics are set up perfectly or perhaps there's a, a specific technique that you just want to learn a little bit more about. Maybe you have a tournament coming up on a new body of water and you want a second pair of eyes on how to approach that. Maybe it's your home body of water and you want to go through some seasonal patterns. I'm offering a service called the Smallmouth Crush One-on-One. -on -one. It's actually a web-based program, so we can meet virtually and I can answer any fishing-related question that you may have, any topics, any questions. We're going to go into detail and then we're going to be able to record that conversation so you can have a copy of that and look look over that in the future. It's a really neat program I'm excited to offer. And if you want to take advantage of this, all you have to do is head on over to my website. Upper right-hand corner, you're going to find the link, Smallmouth Crush One-on-One. -on -one, and it goes into detail as far as what that service 
has to offer, and I look forward to chatting with you. So you're back fishing the western part of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and it sounds like the lakes are a lot different than what you're what you're used to fishing. Do you see any similarities, or is there some big bodies, bodies of water that you fish as well? Is there some river systems? Do you get a little feel of, of what it was like back in Wisconsin, or is it totally different? For the most part, it's a lot of the one to 2,000 acre lakes, which are really good, which have a good fish populations. Obviously, everybody's pretty familiar with Mille Lacs, which is about a uh, two hours from where I'm currently living. Do you and get that one, there a lot? I fish there uh, quite a bit. And honestly, it's one of those places I love to hate, just like oh, really? fishing Sturgeon Bay or fishing Lake Winnebago. It's one of those things if I don't like the stress of always having to watch the wind. <laughs> so it's fun fishing. It can be fun. I'm going to say back when it was just becoming popular, the fishing was probably a lot better. Now the fishing's decent, but it's not like it used to be. Back when it was really good, it was probably more like the, well, the early 2000s up in Sturgeon Bay where you could kind of just, I shouldn't say call your shots, but it was pretty easy. Oh, we oh. forgot to pay the power. Yeah, there we go. the lights went out. <laughs> Those are that's my winter hobby. My fish tank lights went out, so ah, I don't gotcha. get as much illumination. Yeah, so I came over here and you know had pretty good success the first couple of years on my local lakes. And at first, you know, it's like once I learned the lakes, I was like, oh man, things are going to be so easy. But what's really, really surprised me is how much these lakes have fished differently year to year you wouldn't think that a 2000 acre lake where everybody knows the you know every spot on the lake could fish so completely different year after year but it does mm -hmm. and that's what's been i'm gonna say really fun and challenging is that just when i think i have everything figured out <laughs> it changes and you go out there and you're like, what the heck changed? It's like last year, we just smoked them on this lure, that spot. And then you go back, you know, a year later, same time frame, all that, and you can't get bit. So hmm. it's pretty fun to keep working on that and figuring things out and trying to stay on the top of your game that way. It's, like I said, I thought I had it all figured out in the first couple of years and then everything just changed. And it, I mean, that's the one constant seems to be is every year it's something different. A new mm -hmm. lure comes along or, you know, we have a lot of weed spraying and stuff like that, which probably factors into it. So it changes where weeds are growing. It changes what kind of weeds are growing. And then, you know, I'm also starting to see yearly cycles on different types of weeds. You know, every other year, the milfoil comes back really good. But in the off years, maybe it's a good jerkbait bite. You know, just little things like that that mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure things out. But yeah, sometimes I'm successful. Sometimes I'm not. And the times you fail are the ones that try to motivate you to uh, figure it out better the next time. What, what's some of your techniques of choice that you find yourself using quite a bit? Well, <laughs> believe it or not, I try. So what's really popular on a lot of the weed edges is it's the Minnesota jig worm. And it's, you know, guys are throwing a four inch worm on a shaky head, basically, or Ned rigs now. And guys love doing that and on the edge of it. And my favorite is to not fish with a spinning rod. So while everybody's doing that, usually my partner and I'll um, go into the big thick weeds and just start plunking. So I really like the one ounce plunk and we yeah. have, well, I'm sure you, everybody's heard fighter talking about it. And I'm obviously not a fighter when it comes to that type of stuff, but you know, it's those type of lakes, the Minnetonka type of lakes that have this really deep milfoil that, you know, goes out to 10, 15 feet in, you know, dropping it straight down on them and getting that reaction bite and then cranking them up. There's nothing like it. So, and it's a really good way to load the boat quickly, or it's a good way to come in with a zero. So, <laughs> yeah. So I like doing that a lot. There was back when I first moved here, there was an excellent deep cranking bite. I loved love to rip uh crankbait through weeds i threw a lot of jerk baits now even in the summer 
It's one of my things I'm I've gotten pretty good at. I think it's kind of targets a different fish that's maybe suspended more off of weed lines or off a of structure a little bit. So I think that's a perhaps a little bit less pressured fish, and it's something uh-huh. that the fish aren't used to seeing as much around here, unless it's one of my jerk baits, which they've made the mistake of biting before. So right. I guess that's kind of where I'm at much more power type fishing, but there's times when I'll have to uh, sometimes slow down and just grind it out with everybody else on some of the weed edges, trying to get a couple but good bites too. Well, I you... reluctantly do have a spinning rod on the deck most of the time. Right, right. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing nope. wrong with that. <clears throat> I, I got to circle back because you mentioned two key things that I can't just let you, uh, let you off the hook that easy. So ripping a crankbait through grass, I imagine, well, give me the scenario. How deep of, of, of grassland are we fishing? What are you looking for? I really want to know the crankbait. I want to know your setup. Are you a braid? Are you a floral? Are you, how are you doing it? Can you, can you, uh, all right. Hook um, me up. Hook me up. Okay. So the best stuff is coontail. And I don't know if people understand what coontail is, but it's the hard, crunchy, bushy coontail. So that stuff growing on our lakes usually goes out to 10 or 15 feet deep. And you can have these clumps of it out there. And that's what I love ripping through because it breaks off really cleanly and you can rip uh, crankbait through it. So I'm still pretty old school as far as, so DD22, 6XD, sometimes 5X. Okay. Yeah. Those, I like those because you can, well, you can beat (laughs) the weeds off of them and you don't break bills off. A DT10 is really good, but it's fragile. DT14, Mm -hmm. 16, same thing. I like throwing them, but I don't like that the bills come out of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm always throwing on braid. So, and if it's a true weed ripping situation, I'll usually have a duo snap or something similar that I'm doing it on. But if I'm actually like heavy duty weed ripping, I'll tie direct to the eye. And and as that kind of allows more of that line there to cut um, all the way up to the bill. So that's kind of, I shouldn't say my technique, but I'm kind of feeling for something. And then, you know, I had guys that would um, follow me around the lake and they're like, man, the lake association should just pay you to cut weeds. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> because once you do cut the coontail, it'll come floating up to the surface and um, uh-huh. there'll be a bunch of it laying around. But if the fish are in there and, you know, with our main forage around here is bluegills. So those bluegills are all hanging out in above around the coontail at any given time. So it's pretty much a good go-to situation. The DD-22, very popular <laughs> crankbait, probably one of the most popular crankbaits of all times, but very little love lately. Why is I, that? I have no idea. The good news is I bought, well, I think three or four years ago, I was pretty low and they were like stupid cheap on eBay. So I think uh-huh. I bought a ton of them for like two bucks. I'm wow. like, so now I'm probably set for the next 20 years. Yeah. And some people got all hung up on colors and all that. I'm not too hung up on colors i think the fish just are reacting to what's going by them and i don't know are you going to gravitate then more towards like shad pattern or a bluegill pattern or or yeah is there a crazy pattern is there like you know they got so i mean the reds right you got your hot your hot craws your red craws your chartreuses your citrus shads yeah i much more probably the parrot guy you know some of the natural colors and more of the subtle ones rapala did a thing a few years back which was interesting where they came out with some ike colors where they were more like the black and blue crankbait colors and uh green pumpkin crankbait colors i've thrown a lot of those and i i I don't know i caught fish on all of them so that kind of opened my eyes to hey it doesn't really matter i mean if it makes you feel good as a fisherman and you have confidence, that's probably more important than it is to the fish. (laughs) Mm -hmm, So, mm -hmm. but don't get me wrong. I, but there is as all good crankbait fishermen go is, you know, it doesn't, 
you know, some of the guys' favorite ones are these beat up old crankbaits that don't have any paint left on them, but for whatever reason, and, you know, guys talk about hunting, you name it, that they are just seem to perform better than others. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I would always seem to gravitate towards, you know, a couple of crankbaits like that, that were well used and they got so beloved that of course I would only use them then during a tournament because I wouldn't want some pike to come and uh, snatch it from me during practice. (laughs) So I throw suffix 832 and I will go down to 10 pound test, not so much in a straight weed ripping situation, but if I'm really looking like 6XD getting in as deep as possible. So with the eight foot rod, a good long cast, you can get a 6XD to be bumping the bottom in like 22 feet of water pretty consistently. So I would do that for most of my straight up weed ripping. I would go up to about 20 pound braid and then sometimes 30, but the problem with going up to the 30 pound is it doesn't cut weeds as good. So 20 was kind of the soft spot or sweet spot for me. But with that being said, there's a, after a day of weed ripping, you're pretty much stuck respooling because you're going to start getting mm, failures of the line after that many hook sets. Okay. (laughs) So, so I kind of would watch that and, you know, was pretty diligent about changing line anytime i saw issues or you know you know you're jerking and you jerk into a big clump and bust it off and hopefully your crankbait comes floating back up but that type of thing so i always would have a couple rods rigged up similarly so that i could switch out in a tournament as well so so is is this a pattern that you see developing pretty much post spawn throughout the summer then yeah yeah for sure I'm going to say it's a good summer pattern. The bluegills out here. So you have these lakes. If you ever go like idling across them in the middle of summer, it's just clouds and clouds of bluegills over the main basin. So you have this huge population of potato chip bluegills that are kind of just always out there and roaming and whatnot. And then, you know, those are, when those meet the weeds, that's kind of where this pattern seems to be what the best. Kind of, what kind of conditions are ideal? Meaning if somebody wants to start experimenting with throwing a crank in some of these grass lakes, and I'm thinking of a bunch myself over here in the northeast part of the country where this technique would work, are do you find like cloudy, windy days versus dead calm days? Is there, do you find a difference at all? Or is it pretty much, you got to find the fish and you can get them to bite or react possibly on that given day, regardless of conditions? That's a good question. I, I'm just curious, like like if you go, if you launch and it's like sunny and dead calm, are you like, oh man, this ain't going to work or will it? It can, and I'd probably be moving a bit deeper on that, depending on the lake and the clarity and all that. So I still think it can work, especially a long cast, you know, down, you know, a good deep weed break, that type of stuff. Sometimes dead calm, sunny days have been good. But to your point, other days where the wind's ripping and like almost pushing the weeds over, especially if it's milfoil and other weeds that are starting to lay down, you know, sometimes that's where maybe a little bit shallower crank over the tops of it would work too. So I I, gotcha. it's kind of a, I don't know, I'm going to try it. And if I can catch fish doing it, I'll probably stick with it. But it's one of those things too, that I don't know, it's probably can't live or die by it. If it's not working, you can probably flail all day long and not catch a lot of fish. So, and do you see that? Is that something that does happen? Yeah. Could it be yeah. like one day you're you're whacking them, the next day for who knows why it's just not happening, and the very next day it could be back on? Right. Okay. I for sure think so. And I mean, even if you watch bait and stuff like that, I mean, there's times where you can go out to a lake and it's just clouds of bluegills like suspended over the weeds everywhere. And the next day you go out and it's like, where did they all go? It's like, how could they have disappeared? But they're probably down into the weeds or I, again, I don't have all the answers, but it, mm-hmm. you know, just keeping your eyes open and 
I guess, reacting to what you're seeing and what your past experience has been and, you know, keep racking your brain all day on different things to try if things aren't working. And hopefully you get through your Rolodex of confidence, lures, baits, spots, and hopefully sometime during the day you connect with. Figure uh, it out. Yeah. Yeah. Connect with right. the fish that are willing to bite. So, Are you fighting those fish any differently than you would say 10 or 15 pound fluorocarbon on a, a rock edge with a crankbait? When you get a bite in that grass with braid, what are you doing? The good news with coontail is it comes out pretty easily, but you know, there's other milfoil stuff, but honestly, when I'm weed ripping, I have my drag is totally tight because you're ripping it out of the weeds. So Mm -hmm. I'm literally, I don't baby fish and I get it either into the net or if it gets next to the boat, it's flipped in. Um, you know, most of those, you know, the six XDs all have decent enough hooks that I pretty much, unless it's a five plus, um, it's all going to be boat flipped in. Hmm. So I don't baby it. I don't do anything. I just keep the rod loaded up and get it to the boat and in the boat. No messing around. I'm ready, man. That I'm excited. (laughs) I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I mean, geez, me too. uh, some good information. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of ways to fish grass edges and, and these type techniques, not the norm, if you will. And I think that's uh, that's what kind of separates yourself, obviously, as an angler, being able to consistently try these different tricks. I'm interested in the uh, the jerk bait setup that you're talking about. So I imagine, well, I don't want to speak for yourself, but are you ripping that jerk through the grass, or are you trying to stay on the edges of the grass with a jerk bait? Yes, both. I guess mm-hmm. it depends on the type of grass and all that other situation but yeah it's a very similar i'm gonna say you know i kind of did the crank baiting thing uh, quite a bit and it was a pretty natural segue to go into the jerk bait you know because you're ripping a jerk bait and i give them pretty good jerks <laughs> yeah. so it's i mean it i'm not you know, there's no doubt what I'm doing. How about that? If anybody's watching me fish, they're, you know, they're like, how can you keep jerking like that? I'm like, well, that's what the fish want. <laughs> what's, what's Sometimes. Sh- would you, will you get up in some shallower grass too with that? Or are you trying to stay deeper? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, again, it's kind of back to where the bait fish are, you know, so if it's May, I've done really good up on shallower flats where, you know, there's schools of bluegills going across. And, you know, of course the bass are up, generally up shallow, either have spawn or going to spawn or post spawn, you know, so it's, you know, all those flats leading to shoreline, all that stuff, you know, May, June, that's all right. I'm going to say good areas to target. Okay. Okay. Jerk bait of choice. There's hundreds of them out there. It's not too big of a secret. I throw Duo Realis uh, 110, 120, and 130. So three different sizes. Yep. Yeah. They all behave similarly, but they are a little bit different. Um, So just with mine, um, I like the Duos in that they do seem to run a little bit deeper without having a huge bill than some of the other jerk baits that I've used. I've also mm-hmm. liked the KVD deeps, um, the three hook mm-hmm. ones. Those yep. are pretty good. And then I haven't, I've kind of gotten away from some of the lucky craft stuff, not that because they're good, they're not good. Um, it's just, I'm not fishing as shallow, like the 112 MRs and stuff like that. Those are, those, you know, are three they or won't. four foot deep sure. ones that I'm, it's not what I'm generally targeting anymore. So okay. fishing more of the deeper weed edges and, you know, I guess maybe some of the deeper flats that way. So. Dare I ask, I got to know braid or no braid? Or are you going huh? floral on that when you're, when you're doing the grass deal? Is that, I'm assuming uh, you're braid with that as well. I'm a braid guy. Yeah. So straight up ripping that thing. That's right. Dang. I could tell you're a little uneasy talking about these techniques. You only get the secret out, man. This is some yeah, good stuff. No, this is some real well, good stuff. I've, we, I'm not 
saying everything, but right. what do you mean? Okay, we're gonna have to stay on after this podcast because yeah. I need to hear the rest of the story. You know, when we're yeah. off air. <laughs> no, nah, it's. I mean, it's one of those things you kind of have to commit to, and it's you know you just can't go out there and you know expect it to work in thirty minutes, and that's where I think a lot of guys give up on just about any technique out there because if you do stick with it, I was fortunate <laughs> in that when I kind of got onto this thing a few years ago, you know, I started catching fish and I was like, what the heck? I'm just out here seeing how a jerk bait works. You know, right. I went to the clearest lake in my area and all of a sudden I start jacking fish. I'm like, it's in the middle of water skiers. I'm just out here killing wow. time, seeing how a lure works. And I'm like, catching nothing but fish and i ended up catching like the biggest fish i've ever caught on the lake and i'm like uh oh <laughs> so i kind of whatever i kind of i got a little bit lucky in that i got some good initial you know fish on it and then after yep. that the light bulb starts going on and i'm like well maybe i could try it over here and it works and then i go over there and that but as with everything though like I said earlier is, you know, just when I think I have it all figured out and had, you know, a great year fishing a jerk bait, I come back to some of my favorite jerk bait lakes. I don't mm -hmm. get bit. Sure. I'm like, yeah. how could this happen? And right. I just don't get bit. I, you know, or another lake that you think is going to be absolutely perfect because it sets up the same as, you know, Lake X or whatever. And you go there and like, yeah, I've never caught a fish here on a jerk bait and I threw it half a day and I don't get bit. And it's like, mm. how could this happen? But I don't know. That's the fun yeah. of it. And <laughs> there's no good one recipe, which is what makes it frustrating and fun. It sounds can be frustrating, but once you get it dialed in and it's working, it sounds like a great day on the water for sure. Speaking of uh, biggest bass and and whatnot, what's your what's your largest uh, what's your biggest personal fish? Um, ever? I think I my well biggest one I have is a six to eight I think largemouth. What's special about that one is I caught that on Father's Day weekend with my dad fishing. Do you remember Chris Jones and sure. um? He had the Fishers of Men circuit, and we were fishing Lake Geneva uh -huh. down um, southeastern Wisconsin. And I got onto a deep jig bite out there that, again, this is, I think that was 2007. And mm -hmm. that, so I kind of side imaged some deep weeds. I found this little shelf. Anyways, all that to say, I caught a fish out of like 25 feet of water ended up being big bass for the tournament. I think he came in with just under 20 pounds and my fish, I didn't know it at the time because I was kind of new to the deeper water stuff, but my fish needed to be fizzed and uh -huh. I didn't know it. So I ended up having to keep it. And, um, one of the guys mounted it for me. So it's a really good, it's the only fish I have mounted, sure. um, but it's, uh, on my wall with a picture that I got from, uh, Chris Jones, uh, very his, cool, his yeah. photograph plaques that he would always send out. And yep. it's on my wall with a picture of me and my dad holding up my biggest bass, at least to date. And yeah, That's it's a great still story. a great memory after, well. 14 years, 15 years. Yeah. You know, a lot of people that, that are listening to this across the country got to realize we're talking Wisconsin, Minnesota, these fish don't, we don't have these eight, nine and 10 pounders uh, living up North. That's for sure. A six pounder is a, a very old fish and uh, it's definitely a trophy. What would be your favorite body of water? Is it a well-known body of water or something just small? Yeah. One of my favorite places to go and fish, especially tournament fish, is uh, Lake Vermilion in northern Minnesota. It's a, if anybody looks at a map of it, it's really spread out, has tons of structure, and then it's loaded with big smallies and big bass. So mm -hmm. I fished a number of tournaments up there, and, you know, bass divisionals was up there a few years back when I fished it. Great about it is it's, a big body of water, but even if it's windy, you can go find a place to fish that's not completely uncomfortable. And once you take off in the morning, you hardly see another boat. And uh -huh. that's the best part is that you're pretty much, I shouldn't say guaranteed, but the chances of somebody finding the same rock that you did um, and catching fish off of it is very slim. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a really fun, call it 
pure, pretty place to go fish that's loaded with great fish. And yeah, and when the small mouth bites on there, it's off the hook. So it's good times. So part of a drive would that be from say Minneapolis? Uh it's three, three and a half hours okay. north. Um it's just north east west of Duluth a little uh, ways. So sure. um it's it's a pretty I shouldn't say common, but it's one of the bigger bodies of water for like any of the Minnesota state um, championships or anything like mm -hmm. that, um, that it usually rotates around to that. So, gotcha. so it gets a fair amount. I mean, every year or two, it has a pretty decent sized tournament on it. So how many tournaments are you fishing roughly in a year? Are you, are you entering quite a bit? Are you every weekend still or? Oh yeah. Every weekend. Yeah. And then the fun thing here is since it, stays light late in the summer in the one thing i've kind of gotten into is a lot of the evening tournaments it's a lot of fun so we'll fish for like five till nine in the evening there's a tuesday nighter um frankie's tuesday nighter that has pretty much the best anglers in the metro area fishing it so that's a good one mm -hmm. to go against a bunch of guys that are really good sticks so there's a tuesday night wednesday night some thursday nighters and then they have some other stuff like that so if you count those i'm fishing probably 12 evenings a summer in a tournament and then pretty much every weekend from yeah. may until october yeah i think the last time i actually saw you was last year down on chickamauga and you had i think you were doing well in that event right or you did well. yeah we did what well. Was that? was that some type of championship? Yeah. Thing? So that was the, um, what was it? The NBAA national tournament that was held on Chickamauga down in, uh, when was that? It was March, either I beginning can't, of, yeah, remember. either April. end of March or April. But yeah, we ended up coming in second place and I almost, we almost won the boat. Um, but guys that came in first place had an amazing day <laughs> so yeah. they came in with 33 pounds um <laughs> when we had pretty much the biggest bag of the tournament prior to that at like 22 or 23 pounds and then they dropped down 33 pounds of uh yeah mm -hmm. eight and nine pound fish on the scales and yeah they blew us kind of out of the water by six pounds but no it was a great tournament and chickamauga is a fun lake high pressured now of course since the mm -hmm. um right. everybody's pretty much on it and there's so many tournaments there but it's rewarding i think um it again it's probably not what everybody expects going down there but man the caliber of fish that swim in there is uh pretty hard to i mean any cast can be a eight Mm -hmm. or 10 pounder so that's the yeah. fun of it i mean we were throwing up on these <laughs> stupid little sticks along shoreline you're like no way could there be a fish on there and you know it's a six pounder so right. yeah yeah so that's a lot of fun and yeah that was my first real foray too into florida strain bass and those fish are just built differently than our northern fish their jaws are thicker i mean all my little wacky rig i was having to finesse fish and all right. my little wacky rigged hooks and all this other stuff were having a really hard time piercing the jaws of those fish sure yeah <laughs> so yeah but no it was a good time and yeah i think you ended up doing good in your tournament there, that week after least, i think yep. it was yeah yeah right yeah I, so it wasn't my you know, I got by, I did what I had to do, but like you said, was it's not like I imagine imagine going down. You know, you I knew about this championship for a good six months, you know, throughout the winter, and I was like, Man, this is gonna be incredible. And and then you get there and reality hits with, you know, two hundred boats at a ramp. And you go to another ramp and there's another two hundred boats there, uh exactly. highly pressured body water. But you know, doing all these events and 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 fishing as much as you do, do you have what's the future what what would you want to take this at a higher level or are you happy kind of just dominating the local scene right now well it's a good question and as i'm getting older and, and kind of you know my personal career my day job you know i can see retiring in the future and possibly considering you know doing a little bit mm -hmm. more traveling but honestly i like sleeping in my own bed i love sure. the competition and right now i can get 
call it enough competition locally that it kind of scratches that itch that, you know, right. I don't yeah. necessarily have to go, but I mean, I'm very active fishing the bass side of things. I made it to nationals and ended up fifth this last fall down on Monroe, Louisiana. So, I mean, I guess that's my way of trying to get further is the grassroots way through bass, trying to through the bass nation okay. and trying yeah. to make it to the classic. I was one fish away from making it to the classic this year. And, you know, mm-hmm. obviously I think as any bass angler stream, it's, you know, everybody wants to just be able to not go to the classic, but fish in the classic once because right. There's that one in a million chance that, hey, maybe my whatever, fill in the blank, my jerk bait, my favorite technique is going to work great on that lake I'm going to at the classic. And, sure, you know, yeah. you can make the ultimate dream come true. I got a feeling we could go on and on. We're, we're running short on time. This was uh, some great information. I hope everybody uh, appreciated the stuff. I mean, you didn't have to do this, Jim. We really appreciate all this. This has been a. Uh, it's a journey. You know what I mean? It's always about learning and and finding out. I'm always intrigued by what, what someone else's confidence baits are. You actually, um, surprised me as far as what you throw now versus (laughs) what I kind of thought you would, would be talking about on this podcast. So that's awesome. But I got, I got to say, I got to give you a trick question here before we let you go. If I was to give you one bait and one bait only to fish the following season and you could only throw it now you can rig it differently, whatever. But you can only use one. What would that bait of choice be for you? Ah, uh, that's a. Mm, you're only gonna let me pick one. Yep. Um, I probably pick a jerk bait. Really? Really? Okay. I might not win every tournament, but uh-huh. there's gonna be some that I'm gonna win. I'm going to say my second choice, if you just had to use one lure, would be probably uh, the venerable Senko, but right. I couldn't bring myself to throw that for I gotcha. all season. <laughs> Jerk bait. <laughs> but Jerk bait all day long. Wow. Probably. That's awesome. Yeah, probably. And so, dual realis, probably? One yeah. of those? Yeah. 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 All right. Which so, size? 110, 120, 130? Yeah, probably the good old 110. I 110? mean, 110. it'll work everywhere. And then what color? Ooh, um, geez. So I don't, I should know my colors way better for them. Yeah. What are you trying Um, to? So basically the IU type color. I like them. There was the Aaron Martins one with a green back. He did a special color. I really like those. And I I can't remember the color offhand, but you know, anything light colored, shag colored uh, in that. And, oh, they make a couple good the ghost gill patterns oh, that one's really good especially on our lakes that are loaded with gills i'm writing that down <laughs> so, right now yeah ghost gill seriously we really appreciate it. how can we follow you along kind of keep up with what you're doing or you got a little presence on social media are you are you are you anti-social media i'm the only thing I use social media for, for most part is some of my fishing stuff. So, um, yeah. I guess you can find me. I mean, if you really cared, you could try to friend, <laughs> friend me on Facebook, but I don't there even do like the angler page or, you know, come sure. follow my page or anything right, like right. that. So I don't know. I'm kind Low of key. one of those guys that, yeah, I'll Low let key. my, uh, tournament standings, uh, I guess rank me and whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Go from there. I don't need to sell anything. I can just go out, enjoy fishing and competing, which is the fun of the sport. Very good. Very good. Great stuff. All right, Jim, you're welcome back anytime. And as always, guys, until next time, we'll see you on the water. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.